President, fellows and guests, thank you for this opportunity to present uh, the findings of uh, our research project. The Staffordshire Hoard is a quite extraordinary metal detected discovery. It is the largest collection of treasure from the early Anglo-Saxon period ever found, involving a unique combination of objects, mostly military, but some ecclesiastical in function. The objects display exceptionally sophisticated levels of craft, work and artistry, but are all in fragments, having been dismantled from larger parent objects. These characteristics have been apparent since the discovery of the find in July 2009, captivating scholars and the public alike. But what sort of assemblage was this, how was it brought together and why was it buried? In this lecture, we shall present some of the answers that have emerged from the extensive programme of conservation and research carried out under the auspices of Historic England and the joint owners of the Hoard, Birmingham and Stoke City Councils. It will give you a foretaste of the final publication, a book under the Society of Antiquaries imprint, with an integrated digital component hosted by the Archaeology Data Service, which will be freely available online. What we are presenting today depends enormously on the work and ideas of many individual contributors, not least our fellow editor, Leslie Webster. There's a long list of names here, you can see. Um, but she has chosen to leave to us the lecture, Tanya and I. I shall set out the essential character of the Horde, its typology and its chronology, and Tanya will then take over and present the case for what we think the Horde is, viewed in its historical and archaeological context, and the arguments for why it might have been created and deposited. The Horde was found on a ridge of land close to the modern A5 and N6 toll roads, just to the north of Birmingham. The metal detectorist who discovered it, Terry and Herbert, spent over a week recovering finds before he reported his incredible discovery to the Port of Antiquities scheme. And then professional archaeologists became involved. Initially, Staffordshire County Council staff dug a one metre test pit over the find spot. This was expanded into a full recovery excavation undertaken with geophysical survey by Birmingham Archaeology. And they conducted a further um, episode of fieldwork in 2010. Later in 2012, Archaeology Warwickshire undertook more surveying, including controlled metal detection, that recovered a small number of further fragments and finds from the hall. Knowledge of what the hoard contained has changed significantly as the challenging task of cleaning and rejoining has proceeded. From almost 4,600 fragments at the end of conservation, nearly 700 objects have been identified. And this was no mean feat, as from the outset the owners of the hoard um, gave a commitment to keeping as much of it on public display as possible. And this often resulted in fragments from more than one object being in more than one location. Whilst the majority of the fragment relationships were identified by 2014, some objects did not fully emerge until late in the research project. And one of them, which should be illustrated here, but seems to have dropped off the... Um, there is it. <laughs> Um, that is the uh, object. Um, this rather strange object is a socketed stand that we believe was a socketed stand for a great gold cross in the collection. And it was assembled from over 60 pieces of silver sheet and beaded strip. And it wasn't recognised until 2016. This un example underlines how the fragility of the silver sheet has caused an inverse relationship between weights and fragment counts in the hall. 
the four kilograms of gold and 1.7 kilograms of silver is reversed by the silver fragment count. The, fra there are, the, the silver is far more fragmented than the gold. Whilst many of the objects retain garnets, or more rarely other inlays, there is very little copper alloy, virtually no iron, and only vestigial traces of organic materials, including horn, wood, and wax protein pastes, and, uh, and glues. These would all have been essential components of the artefacts from which almost all the fittings had been removed. The contents of the hoard was thus highly selected, favouring precious metal. The objects were also drawn entirely from the possessions of men and the apparatus of war, even arguably the Christian objects. The majority, 80% by object count, are fittings from weapons. Most come from swords, with a small number of, from saxes that is, large fighting knives. Their array of forms and ornament, some quite new, are transforming our understanding of the weapon, its makers and its warrior elite users. On the basis of the minimum number of pommels, that is 74, and potential combinations of other hilt fittings present, we estimate that something like 100 swords were dismantled. With one certain exception, they appear to be of Anglo-Saxon manufacture. And that exception is this one up here, Pommel 68, which has animal art that indicates a Scandinavian origin. It may or may not be associated with this strange object here, which is a sword ring. Most of the Pommels take a cocked hat form and fit within Mengin's type Beckham Volsonarum, which was in use between circa 570 and 650. A smaller number are round back forms, a form that in Anglo Saxon England was in use in the 7th century. <coughs> the 98 gold hilt collars include a remarkable 40 pairs. Hilt collars could be tall, like this one, or narrow, and they were fitted at the top and the bottom of the grip of the sword. We also have uh, an array of hilt rings, these, these fittings here. This example here is very similar to a pair that are fitted to the Sutton Hill Mount One sword. There are over 170 hilt plates in the collection. And you can see again on the diagram, on the schematic, where these would have fitted. From the form of the plate, and from marks left on them, from fit other fittings from the hilt, it has been possible to say where on the sword they were fitted. And from that, we've been able to say something about the number of sets, and how proportionate that amount is with the other types of fitting. Unlike the forms discussed so far, the over 100 small mounts are decidedly unfamiliar. Many are decorated with a very fine filigree scroll work ornament, and it was only after a trip to the British Museum to inspect the so-called Cumberland hilt of preserved horn that their purpose became apparent. They were made to be inserted into recesses cut into the grip and guards secured by nails and presumably some form of glue. You can see the x-ray here showing the nails used on the, on the Cumberland hilt. And we have similar small nails in the board with these fittings. Also importantly, their association with a sword hilt without a metal pommel in this case, implies that the number of weapons represented in the hoard is more than the 74 surviving pommels. Some hilt mounts are new forms, so they have a few fold and parallels. They include pairs and sets of zoomorphic form from the grips, 
like these bird headed mounts and this, the, this bird mount here, you can see where these would have fitted on the grips. And then there are also sets of these V-shaped fittings, which it took a little while to work out where they came from, and these two would have been fitted onto the guards. And you can see here we have a set of four indicating mounts for the top and the bottom guard of the sword. Um, most of the fittings have come from hilts. There's very few fittings from scabbards. And this is a, a selection of the fittings from scabbards. We have five sets, five pairs of sword pyramids. And these would have fitted somewhere on the scabbard like this. And we also have a pair of these little sword buttons. And beside that we have just three buckles, which may or may not have been part of sword harness. In some, the sword fittings reveal an array of styles best appreciated from those forming sets. And they indicate unquestionably that sword hilts were manufactured as matching suites in the period. The different styles, it is argued, could reflect the outputs of different regions or kingdoms. Whilst fittings in gold with filigree wire ornament, like this one at the end here, and with the Alamar designs in Salim's Sal style too appear most favoured. We also have sets of cloisonne fittings, and then we also have, as I've, as I've said, these sets of small fittings for a Cumberland hilt type style. The cloisonne style pommels are most like the pommel on the Sakabu Malmon sword. And the cloisonne workmanship of many pieces also finds its closest parallels in the same regal assemblage. Cast work is rarer and mostly in silver. Completely new is a style of sword fittings in silver with gold mounts. It is exemplified as shown here by Pommel 76 with its extraordinary double fixed sword ring knobs on its shoulders that are unique in Europe, an associated hilt collar, 188, and then there's a pair of also unique silver guards with gold filigree mounts. And as well as gold filigree, the suite also has uh, garlic and glass cos on it. And here's an artist's reconstruction of what this set of fittings would have originally looked like on the sword hilt. The hall contains the remains of at least one crested helmet, similar to examples from Scandinavia and England, most notably again Sutton Boom Mound 1. But yet more magnificent because it was originally largely gold in appearance and not silver. Nothing remains, however, of an original iron cap, so reconstruction has proved a challenge. And this reconstruction work was undertaken with George Speak. We've been given special permission today to show the reconstruction of the helmet which will be officially released to the public tomorrow. So keep an eye on the papers for this. Um, the surviving structural parts include a two section crest piece and a pair of silver gilt cheek pieces, both decorated with complex style to animal the crest would have held a horsehair or possibly feather material, a feature that is not found on any of the other um, helmets parallels from the early medieval world, but which is well known on their ultimate models, Roman helmets. There is also a curved silver band around the base of the helmet, which contained a stamped gilt silver sheet showing kneeling warriors. Here, here is the style two analog from, from the cheek pieces. <coughs> Many other designs have been reconstructed from the well over 1,000 fragments of dye pressed silver gilt sheet, including ones in, again in animal art, style two animal art, and most strikingly, figural scenes of marching, riding, and dancing aristocratic warriors. Arguably, this is now the grandest of the known crested helmets. 
and it presents a symbolic narrative embodying religious beliefs and probably, possibly, dynastic origin legends. Surely, we conclude, it was fit for a king. Many of the over 20 large mounts in the hall form sets, and most of them are heavily inlaid with garments. Possibly they emanate from a single workshop. Some could come from ostentatious military parade gear, uh, as suggested here, like a saddle, with, in the case of this mount, little inset mounts, each of which is decorated with a little filigree serpent. And then we have this, uh, these two pieces from a silver set of mounts with um, the yellow decoration again imitating cloisonne and with a pair of eye shaped mounts. And we've suggested this as uh, fittings from a horse's bridle. However, it must be stated that the function of many of these large mounts remains uncertain. Most unexpectedly, some of the large mounts reveal ecclesiastical treasures created for and by the first or the second generation of the early Anglo-Saxon church. The inscribed strip has been subject to much debate. The niellowed text on the obverse here, and a slightly different rendering on the reverse, comes from the Book of Numbers. In Richard Gamerson's translation for our publication, shown here, Moses' invocation of God's protection for the Israelites in the wilderness, spoken when the Ark of the Covenant was raised up, takes on a new ferocity. It endorses the hypothesis that the strip was part of a cross mounted on a reliquary shrine designed to be taken into battle. Provocatively, one feasible reconstruction for one set of cloisonne fittings with eye-shaped mounts is as fittings for an ark or a house-shaped shrine. Gamerson also argues that there is nothing to oppose the 7th century date for the inscribed strip. Also, significantly, the technical similarity of this flattened D-shaped boss at the end of the strip is so similar to one on the lower leg of the Great Cross, to which I shall turn in the next slide, it suggests a similar uh, shared origin. The Great Gold Cross, found folded but reconstructed to a height of about 30 centimetres, could have been both carried into battle processionally, or it could have also functioned in a stand as an altar cross. Based on the Roman crux gemata, in gold, its gold and blood red would have recalled the cross of victory that had played a major role in the elite reception of Christianity since Constantine's vision at the Milvian Bridge in the 4th century. The Anglo-Saxon dream of the room also describes just such a vision. The portent was all covered with gold, Beautiful gems appeared at the corners of the earth, and there were also five upon the cross beam. The accomplished integration of fluid style to animal art decoration and red garnet bosses that symbolise the wounds of Christ, with the mound of gold gotha at the base of the cross, is remarkable. Moreover, one animal art motif from the arm of the cross has been shown to be a copy of one that decorates the rims of maplewood cups in the Sutton Hoo Mound 1 burial, a burial coin dated to circa 620 to 640. Cross and the inscribed strip, therefore, may date from about or just before the mid 7th century. So too might this remarkable sub-conical mount with its column and disc mount on top that is linked with the cross 
artistically, sharing very similar style to animal art. Leslie Webster argues that it is a bishop's headdress, a realisation of 7th century Anglo-Saxon conceptions of Jewish high priest's headgear, as also portrayed in the image of Ezra in the Codex Antinus. Typological analysis has thus taken us some way towards establishing the character of the horde. But to explain how it came into being and why it was buried, we must first establish when and where it was made, where its objects were made. The concept of object biography or life history has been current in archaeology for some time. But it is particularly commended as a way for considering how hordes were formed, the reuse of the objects within, within them, and looking at their deposition. The Staffordshire Hall has produced an enormous range of information about its production and about early Anglo-Saxon manufacture in general. Most significant for this lecture is the evidence from the filigree and the cloisonne work. Filigree dominates the, the hall. It decorates about 60% of its objects. But whilst much of it compares well with artefacts from Kentish southern England, atypical forms point to significant production beyond this area. And this is analysis that's been undertaken with Neve Whitfield, with her, with her extensive knowledge of uh, filigree of the early medieval world. The ultimate, and the ultimate inspiration for these filigree fittings, collars and pommels, may well have been earlier 6th century fittings that we find on Scandinavian swords. The cloisonne, by contrast, especially the zoomorphic designs within the cloisonne, uh, as well as the mushroom and arrow geometric cell patterns, and the use of gold lidded cells, are all technical and artistic details that are best paralleled in East Anglia, notably in the Sun Hoon. Indeed, the distribution of the 15 gold and or garnet poles and hilt fittings that are now known from outside of the hall, which this map shows, suggests that much of the material in the, in the collection could have emanated from Anglian areas north of the Thames, including from the kingdoms of East Anglia, Lindsay and Northumbria. study of wear, repair and modification of the fittings was also a consideration um, when constructing and putting together the catalogue. Every object was assessed for uh, consideration of its wear and repair and modification. For example, wear patterns on pommels and on the tips of fittings um, show that these are the areas on a sword that seem to have been most vulnerable to wear. And we suggest that this probably reflects swords being worn <coughs> habitually at the waist as a, as a piece of costume. And that this is the result of the, the hilt of the sword rubbing against clothing. On the whole, it was found that uh, the differential degrees of wear on the fittings correlate with the chronology of the objects and their suggested typology and style. Given the rare typological character of most of the objects, the absence of coins and as yet insufficient material uh, with which to conduct absolute scientific dating, the animal art that decorates much of the collection has proved fundamental to establishing the Hort chronology. And animal art has long been used in Anglo-Saxon archaeology to date artefacts and context in general. Salim style one, shown with an example shown here, occurs on just two fittings, and it's an art of the later 5th and 6th centuries in England. In fact, this pair of uh, hilt collars with their highly disarticulated style one may well be the oldest objects in the collection. In comparison, 
objects with uh, the following style, Saline style 2, of the later 6th and 7th centuries, occurs on 140 objects in total. My research proposes that the two distinctive forms of style 2 known from Anglo-Saxon England that are seen in the board reflect chronological rather than regional difference. And to summarise simply, the early form of the ornament of style 2 comprises highly abstract, legless, zoomorph creatures. There's a, there's a, you, these are very strange creatures. You have their jaws, their heads, and these serpent-like <coughs> bodies. Whilst the later form is counterintuitively comprises more recognisable quadruped animals. I've dated these two forms of style two by comparison with animal art objects from graves found across Europe, which are themselves dated scientifically or by points. Taken together, the chronological arguments identify four <coughs> overlapping phases of production in the hall. The first consists of relatively few objects, made in silver during the 6th century. Now these are truly, these would have come from heirloom swords. And the fittings have affinities with objects from Kent and Scandinavia. The vast majority of the collection, however, comprises objects in gold. Hoard phase two is characterized by the filigree fittings, by the use of early style two, and by Cumberland hilt style fittings, decorated with scroll work. It is dated to about 570 to 630. That's the date of the manufacture of these objects. Hall phase three is marked by the garnet cloisonne and later style two use. It starts perhaps around 610 and it lasts up to about the mid seventh century. Finally, the few silver items uh, with gold mounts and a dense form of interlace representing an early insular style we've placed around the mid 7th century. From this, we have concluded that the hoard was probably deposited between circa 650 and 675. And I shall now hand over to Tan. So what does this all mean? Archaeologists have tended to interpret hoards in a binary manner, either as economically valuable materials that were hidden for safekeeping, but for some reason not recovered, or as objects committed permanently for ritualized reasons to engage with the supernatural, as gifts for the gods, or as a compliment for the dead. Studies informed by modern archaeological theory, as recently and appositely outlined by Richard Bradley, suggest, however, that boarding practices were far more complex. The structuring and the motives behind hoards, a hoard biography, so to speak, may be revealed by combining detailed analysis of their intrinsic contents with examination of their extrinsic context in the ground and in the landscape. Much has been inferred from <coughs> internal evidence about the constituent character of the Staffordshire Hoard, as Chris has just outlined. To repeat, in its material, art, and symbolism, it belongs to the pinnacle of 7th century Anglo-Saxon masculine and martial society. It represents the powers, secular and spiritual, on which kings depended. Yet it was in fragments, deliberately dismantled and selectively assembled. 
Unfortunately, external evidence relating specifically to the board's context is limited. So our model biography depends more on historical and archaeological knowledge of the late Roman and early medieval worlds that engendered the hoard, and which have been ably surveyed by our fellow contributors to the publication. Whilst the artefacts can be compared generally to finds elsewhere in high status contexts, there is nothing that completely matches the hoard's combination of multiple weaponry, precious material, and fragmentation. Certainly not among the well-known princely burials of late 6th and early 7th century England, or even the war sacrifices of South Scandinavian wetlands of the 4th to 5th centuries. Or in the abundant uh, corpus of treasure hoards, whether from late 4th and 5th century Britain or from 4th to 7th century mainland Europe and Scandinavia. In fact, the diversity of these near contemporary hoarding practices, rather than supplying neat analogies, forces us to consider a range of models, especially given that hordes in general um, are rare in the late 5th to 7th century in England. So, how did the hoard come together? We suggest that the Staffordshire Hoard was buried at some time in the third quarter of the 7th century. At this stage, its fine spot lay within the territory of Mercia, the marches or borderers, the last major Anglo-Saxon kingdom to emerge into history, but not yet the power it would become in the 8th century. According to the not always consistent pages of Bede's ecclesiastical history and the later Historia Britonum, Mercia was born of protracted warfare waged by its pagan king Penda, often in alliance with Welsh kings and mainly against Anglian neighbours to the east, in particular Northumbria. The 650s seem to have been particularly turbulent with the deaths of Penda at the Battle of the Windways in 655, and a year later, the murder of his recently converted son, Peada, um, before another son, Wulfhere, was eventually restored to the throne. Wulfhere and his brother, Ethelred, then enjoyed long reigns, the continuing the expansion of the kingdom through warfare but particularly to the south. We've also suggested that the objects in the hoard mainly came from areas controlled by Anglian kings, notably, as Chris said, Lindsay, East Anglia, and Greater Northumbria. Mercy itself lay at the cultural boundary between Anglians and Britons, as expressed by furnished burial, uh, yeah, to the east of the blue line, <coughs> and by the incidence of metal detected finds. <coughs> Although Anglo-Saxon settlement is evident in the middle Trent Valley from the late 5th century onwards, and in, the seventh, uh, and, and in the 7th century, the Peak District is characterised by rich barrow burials, there is nothing to suggest that the Mercians were manufacturing prestige equipment in the way other kingdoms were. The objects in the hoard have been brought into Mercia, but how? Circulation of movable wealth was fundamental to building and maintaining early medieval policies. Uh, here in Johann Nikolai's recent rendering of Royman's 1990 model. 
Just as in the late Roman Empire, the material forms and life histories of treasure and the context of their gifting or exchange embodied hierarchical relationships of status and obligation between giver and receiver. Less like the Roman Empire, however, early Anglo-Saxon kings depended especially on warfare to recoup and supplement their stock of treasure, and thus to maintain the system. We imagine that both pitched battles and raids on rival seats or monasteries could have delivered booty, compensation payments and tribute, which would underlie the whole of material. The weaponry in the hoard was probably made in elite workshops for circulation among leading members of royal retinues. Some of the items, represented by the large mounts, like the putative saddles, could have played a role in alliance building between dynasties. The ecclesiastical treasures might have been gifts to or products of churches, but they, and iconic items like the helmet, are unlikely to have circulated widely, if at all. Given the date range of the hoard objects, they must have joined the hoard cumulatively and probably episodically. But we cannot specify exactly when or how each individual item came to form part of treasures or treasuries, nor how they then entered Mercia. Nor, without better historical evidence, can we assign their final gathering and subsequent deposition in Mercia to particular events in the past? That the circumstances leading up to and beyond the Battle of the Windwade provide several provocative and apposite general models. At or towards the end, the assemblage underwent extensive damage, with fistings systematically, if crudely, stripped away. Evidence of knives used to cut or lever, and tools like tongs to pull off pommels is widespread amongst the material, and it's likely that this was the work of smiths who also would have had the skills necessary to select out only the precious metals. And it's noticeable that there's very little gilt copper alloy. One explanation for all this is that it was part of a regular process of precious metal control, decommissioning goods in order to recycle their raw materials into new objects for a new round of circulation. But if so, the job was only half done. It's possible that some of the missing fittings might already have found their way into a crucible, but the items that were retained still included garnets and other material. Such a functional explanation also overlooks the extremely selective character of the objects, supreme symbols of the power of a king, rather than a random or sensible sample from a royal treasurer. The alternative is that the hoard was an ideological act, a deactivation of the object's symbolic agency, perhaps as part of the defeat and humiliation of a political rival, or because the material was actually perceived as tainted and too dangerous to be kept. The apparently gratuitous removal of an arm of the cross pendant, and what one might say was the effective defacement of the helmet, might support this argument. Of course, recycling might also have accommodated such motives, but if so, that task was interrupted by unknowable events leading instead to burial. Alternatively, burial had always been the intention. So finally, 
we turn to the context of burial. And sadly, this is where we have least evidence. <coughs> Only 13% of the fragments have known locations and then only to the one metre grid squares used in the excavation. <coughs> it's, they're spread over something like 215 square metres and are entirely within or even on top of the plough soil. But the distribution does suggest a core area of about 3 to 4 metres square. The mixture of small fragments, especially of silver, in the 21 soil blocks, which were reportedly removed from a two metre square area, could represent the filtrate at the base of a pit. But the ploughing that finally disturbed the treasure had removed all evidence of context. And the only indications that the items might have been put into containers or perhaps into bags are the folding of some objects and a single fragment of textile. The hoard lay at the northern end of a ridge of land, that's the dashed line. Um, and, uh, that was the the area of the excavation I showed you from the last slide. And aerial photographs have revealed some sort of circular feature at this point, which is the red. Geophysical survey have captured two concentric rings in the same place, which were identified in excavation as naturally occurring ice wedges but which have been, it's been suggested could have supported some sort of distinctive vegetation. The hoard lay between and over the ice wedges. There is nothing else in the field that has been observed to indicate um, uh, its use um, until the, its enclosure uh, in the 19th century. The only other evidence of Anglo-Saxon activity is a disc mount from horse harness in the art style of our horde phase four. The distance of the two located fragments from the horde itself suggests that the mount was probably not part of the horde, but either a casual loss by some contemporary visiting horseman or a deliberate but separate deposit. The last clues to the hoard's meaning lie in its topographic location. On the one hand, this seems peripheral. Environmentally, the area was part of Cannock Chase, exploited for its wood and heathland resources, but marginal to agriculture until the 18th and 19th centuries. Culturally, as we've already seen, it was on the fringe of early Anglo-Saxon penetration. Politically, it lay between several small folk territories that became incorporated into the Kingdom of Mercia. The Pencaserta to the west of Canton Chase, Wednesfeld, a royal estate to the southwest, and the Thomaserta to the east where Mercia's bishopric was founded in 669 at Lichfield, and later, of course, Tamworth was developed as a, a secular uh, centre. On the other hand, the site overlooks Watling Street, the major Roman road leading from southeast England into Wales, and it is near its junction at Wall with Rickfield Street, the route from Mercia into Northumbria. The site was thus eminently accessible and perhaps had been marked by distinctive vegetation and would have been quite identifiable. Yet, it was also liminal. It was out in the landscape, exactly the sort of place which was used in prehistory for ritualized deposition and in the early Middle Ages for assemblers. 
There are then multiple possibilities for exploring and explaining the Staffordshire Hoard, as well as many uncertainties. Chris and I have been able to give you only a glimpse of the arguments to date, and we're fully aware that they leave considerable scope for further debate, questions, and more research. In the end, it is actually impossible to say why the report was treated as it was. But our two leading suggestions are these. It was an assemblage of royal treasure in transition between decommissioning and recycling, but where completion of this trajectory had been arrested by unknown circumstances, leading to a final deposition. Or, it was the deliberate and permanent removal of royal treasure from circulation for political, superstitious, or religious reasons. Thank you.